The first law clerk, who, who you've already met, and so in, introducing him as a bit of an anticlimax, is Phil Neal. No hip. Uh, Phil <laughs> Neal, a native of Chicago, uh, attended its schools, uh, then became a student at Harvard College, graduated, and after briefly studying economics uh, and recovering from rheumatic fever, I believe, uh, enrolled in Harvard Law School and became a very successful student there. Uh, by the time he graduated, he was the president of the Harvard Law Review, which is a tremendous academic honor and really a position of amazing power in the American Legal Academy for a, a young person to hold. Uh, and was then hired by Robert Jackson to be his law clerk beginning in 1943. Phil was with Jackson for those two terms. Uh, he should have served Jackson until about June of 1945, but just as Felix Frankfurter, Jackson's colleague uh, and friend and, and soulmate on the court, took a great interest in, in young people of promise, and Phil Neal was one of them. And there was a day on which Felix Frankfurter asked Phil Neal, what are you going to do next? And Phil, you know, kind of, I think, shrugged and said something about how his, his health had, re had resulted in him not being eligible for military service during the war. Maybe he could do something during the peace. At which point Frankfurter grabbed him, uh, and it's great, each of these law clerks has used this phrase separately, grabbed me by the elbow in that vice-like way that Frankfurter had, grabbing me by the elbow, and marched Phil Neal down to Frankfurter's chambers, picked up the phone, called Alger Hiss over at the State Department and told him, you know, wonderful young man, clerkship ending, uh, serving in the peace, and, and before you knew it, uh, Phil was in Hiss's office interviewing for something that became the United Nations project. Uh, Phil knew that Jackson had already hired a successor law clerk, Murray Gardner, who we'll introduce in a moment. And so Phil first, maybe by telephone, grabbed Murray by the elbow and made sure Murray was available. And having figured out that they could cover Jackson, went to Jackson and said, I have an opportunity. Murray can start early if I can go and, and serve the State Department and be part of this project. And, and Jackson, um, with enthusiasm, uh, gave Phil his blessing, and so the clerkship transition occurred. Phil Neal worked at Dumbarton Oaks uh, on that phase of the United Nations project, and then went to San Francisco and worked on that phase of the United Nations project in the summer of 1945. Uh, and uh, that's an extraordinary moment in time. It's a, it's a moment of time to, to think seriously about at this moment in time. Uh, he also, I think, fell in love with the San Francisco Bay Area and then stayed briefly practicing law with a firm there, and then joining the law faculty at Stanford Law School. He was at Stanford and became a professor until 1962, when he was uh, prevailed upon, recruited, unveiled, uh, to become the dean of the University of Chicago Law School in his hometown. An extraordinary institution, I think you generally know, many of you are lawyers, what the University of Chicago Law School stands for, its place in American legal education, and, and part of that accomplishment is the generation in which Phil Neal presided over that school. Uh, he was the dean of the University of Chicago Law School for 13 years and a member of its faculty until 1983, at which point, you know, life's long, why not have multiple careers, Phil Neal went back into private practice and was part of founding uh, a firm that today bears his name first, Neal Gerber and Eisenberg, and actively practices a variety of of law, uh, you know, to this moment, I'm surprised he, he doesn't have a phone going off as we're as we're here tonight. Uh, so it's a it's a great pleasure to welcome Phil Neal, who was an extraordinary contributor to our discussion this afternoon. Okay, so this is not on a program, and since we're talking about introductions, uh, I'm going to ask Phil Neal to come up and to tell a story which. He told today about his, uh, his name is Phil, in case you, you wonder, you look at it for you, it's a misspelling, but it in fact is Phil. And with that, uh, I, I'm going to embarrass you and ask you to come up and tell this story because it's apropos. <laughs> Chicago, at which 
Justice Tom Clark was uh, was also speaking, and I I you know him and had a had a friendly relationship with him. Uh, but he preceded me on the program, and uh, toward the end of his speech, right at the end of his speech, he saw me sitting there and made some reference to my friend Phil, and uh, said, I hope it's all right to refer to the dean as by his first name, and then he kind of finished his remarks, and I was up and, and groping for some kind of light remarks to open my talk with. Uh, as I walked up, I thought about this, and I got there, and I said, Justice Park, it's perfectly all right for you to call me by my first name. I'm, I'm pleased by that, and especially because I've always felt I have a certain kinship with you, and that we both suffered under the burden of having first names that are really nicknames. And I, I said, all my life, people have been asking me, whatever happened to your if? And I guess all your life, people have been asking you, whatever happened to your <laughs> It was one of my more successful impudences in the course of my career. And I still meet lawyers who remind me of, of that event. <laughs> I repeated it here, and some people seem to like it. Since I'm, <clears throat> since I'm on my feet, though, I, <laughs> I want to take the opportunity to say what a great honor and pleasure it's been to be here uh, for this event, which has given me occasion to recall many things I haven't thought about for years. And, uh, and really to kind of reflect on what Justice Jackson and his, what his influence has been on, on my life, which I think has been one of those things you're not particularly conscious of, uh, but which my wife has kind of brought to my attention as have, having been a pretty signal influence in the things that I have, have valued and try to do in my lifetime. So I'm, I'm very grateful to the Robert Jackson Center for this opportunity, and I'm tremendously admiring of what is being done by the Robert Jackson Institute and Center, and uh, and I guess I can uh, kind of summarize all that by paying great tribute to Greg for what he's done, and so I'd like to end by saluting Greg and, and the Center and wishing him well. Thank you.